Mm. Jagrative. Jai Masters. There's an expression that experience is the best teacher. That's actually very, very, very true spiritually. When you haven't had an experience and it's unknown to you, it's naturally scary. You're naturally apprehensive about it. You've never experienced it. You don't know anything about it. Because the way we live inside ourselves is the truth of the matter is we don't know anything. We've just kind of dropped in here. You look out and there's a world out there. And it's not comfortable because you don't understand how you fit. You don't understand what's going to happen. You don't understand if you'll be okay. So the indwelling you, you in there, when you look out into this world, you kind of start off with it's not okay. There's only things that I've already experienced, mommy, daddy, crib, that which I've experienced, I've learned to become comfortable with. That which I have not experienced, I'm not comfortable with because I don't understand it. It doesn't fit in me. I don't know how to explain it, but you should understand. You build in your mind, that's where the, the self, your consciousness tends to live is in the mind. You build in your mind this sense of recognition. And it's your model of the world. And from your very young age, and then you expand out, you end up with this model of what you're comfortable with, what you're not comfortable with, what you've experienced before, sort of like your, your limits of your comfort zone. And that is all about what you've already experienced and how you did with it. So you end up living inside this comfort zone. That's the only area that you built inside yourself where you feel a certain sense of control a certain sense of, I'm okay. The world doesn't fit inside that comfort zone. It, it, just, it just does its own thing, and you never know what's going to happen next. And that's why people are so scared. That's why there's all these control issues, is because there's only a certain area within our mental panorama that we have experienced and are comfortable with. It's funny to say, and many of you may not agree, but even if you're uncomfortable with something, as long as you know it, Right? That person's my friend. That person's my enemy. If your friend came up and started treating you mean, you'd get all weird. You'd freak you out completely. If your enemy came up and started treating you really, really nice, you would get just as freaked out. In other words, you have this model inside your mind in which you're living. It's called your comfort zone where I know what's going on. And as long as I know what's going on, I can protect myself, I can prepare myself, I can feel a sense of comfort. That's why we call it your comfort zone. If something happens outside that is outside of that zone, your immediate reaction is one of fear. Your immediate reaction is one of discomfort. Your immediate reaction is one of protecting yourself. It's almost like this comfort zone inside our mind becomes like a shield that we live within. And if something happens outside of that, We have to find a way to integrate. We have to find a way to either keep it out or to integrate it in. And that's what this whole talk's going to be about. The difference between keeping it out and integrating it in and maybe even getting rid of the comfort zone, but I won't talk about that yet because that will be so uncomfortable to you. But certainly you can relate to what I've just said, all right? And that's why we try to control our environment. That's why only certain people are allowed in our houses. That's why I, I mean, the epitome of a story is somebody once told me he had a grandmother who lived you know, on the 20th floor of a New Jersey tenement, right? And he talked to grandma. He'd call grandma. And grandma was so scared and said, why, grandma? I can't sleep at night. Why can't you sleep at night? I look out the window and I saw a car parked down on the street that I didn't recognize. My God, you're 23 stories up. It's New York, all right? There's a car parked down there that you don't recognize, and you're freaking out. That's the epitome of what I'm talking about, that we are only comfortable with that which we understand. This talk's going to touch so many things. Notice it touches understanding. If I understand it, I can get comfortable with it. If I don't understand it, I'm uncomfortable, aren't I? But you can only understand that which falls within your frame of reference. It doesn't mean that that which you can understand is better than that which you don't understand. You just haven't experienced it yet. You haven't had the data. It hasn't come in. So you start realizing how limited you have to live. 
And that's how we live. We don't realize it. But our comfort zone defines the quality of our life. And so we try to glue down relationships, glue down how people treat us and how we treat them and what the weather's going to be like. Like If the weather doesn't behave the way you expected it to, you get weird. It wasn't supposed to rain today. I put the wrong clothes on. But we're not like that. If the driver in front of you is not driving the way you want, tell me what happens inside. If they're 10 miles an hour below the speed limit and you can't pass them, it gets weird, doesn't it? It's just pay attention to what we have done. We have locked ourselves, meaning you, the soul, the self, the hi in there. I should have started that way. You in there? Hi. All right. You in there have built this conceptual model based on your past experiences. That's all you have. That's what we're going to talk about. You built this model and it represents your comfort zone, not necessarily what you like or what you dislike. Either way, as long as I know about it, right, I'm, I can find a way of being comfortable but if something comes in from left field, I'm not comfortable. If something doesn't behave the way it's supposed to, I get very weird inside. So let's talk about that. Now what happens is a person who's not wise, who doesn't recognize this, spends their entire life trying to make the world fit within their comfort zone. And they develop the comfort zone very early in life. And then basically they try to hang out with people who are that way. They try to have circumstances that way. All their preconceived notions of what is supposed to happen, what was supposed to happen, everything has to fit within the comfort zone. And if it doesn't, if something happened, let's be honest, if something happened in your past 10 years ago that did not fit within your comfort zone, it's still bothering you. It still comes up. It still haunts you at night. You still have dreams about it. Things remind you of it. Not everything, but you see what I'm saying. It doesn't go away. That, I said, you have two choices. Experiences happen to you. Either you learn from them or you resist them. You can't make experiences not happen to you. The world's going to unfold. So there's only two things you can do. When they come in to you, because that's what happens, experiences come in to you, and they hit your zone, and they're not comfortable. They haven't experienced them before. They're not the normal thing. You either resist them, so they don't create that sense of discomfort or you learn from them so that your comfort zone expands. And I'm telling you, that's your only choice. You're not going to make it not happen. You're not going to create a world where only what you want is going to take place. Maybe you've noticed that yet. So I'm telling you what to focus on is instead of saying I'm going to go out there and control the day and everybody and everything in it, by my actions to try to manipulate and control the world around me so it fits within my comfort zone. And if it doesn't, I'm going to get upset. I'm going to push it away. I'm going to rationalize it. I'm going to blame. I'm going to do all these things. You know, I'm going to basically say it shouldn't have happened. Right or wrong? It's wrong. You know how I know something's wrong? It bothered me. (laughs) Okay? That's when you know it's wrong. And if it really bothered you, then it was really wrong, wasn't it? Okay, they shouldn't have done that or said that. Well, that's just because it didn't fit your comfort zone. So let's talk about, I don't want to talk about the comfort zone. I think you all understand you've done that. You have this model inside of what's okay with you and what's not, what you're comfortable with, what you're not, what you like and what you don't. Okay, where did you get that? You were not born with it. It is not in your genetics. It was a learned experience. You had experiences and they left these impressions on you. This was one that was nice, this one that wasn't nice. And so those experiences built this model of what you want and what you don't want and what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with. And if you don't pay attention, then you're going to spend your entire life trying to find what fits within your comfort zone. This is the house I always dreamt that I would live in. Well, somebody proposes to you, but you you can't afford a house like that, so I, no, I can't marry you. Oh, that's so cute. Do you love him? Oh, yeah, I love him a lot. I've never loved him. No, 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 no. That house, I've always dreamt of that house. And so basically, you build this model, and it got made up of what movies you saw or what you heard about or what your parents were like or what they weren't like. Just all these experiences you had left these impressions inside, and you built a mental, it's a mental model. You built a mental model of what it is that you want to happen and what it is you don't want to happen. And based on that model, you will either be comfortable or uncomfortable with the events that are unfolding. Because people don't pay attention to this, 
they devote their lives, their whole lives, every minute of them, to try to get that which matches what they built inside. And I'm here to tell you that is a waste of your life. That is a complete waste of your life. If you get what you want, you don't grow. I like to equate it to you're trying to learn to play tennis. And you have to be really good at the forehand. But you suck at the backhand. You're not good at that at all. You have very weak wrists and you don't like to exercise them. Right? So you get yourself a tennis coach because you want to play better. And you know what that tennis coach does? How dare him? I'm paying him. He keeps hitting to my backhand. I'm good at my forehand. I kept telling him I'm good at my forehand. I can really play well and slam him and everything, right? And I, I'm bad at my backhand. Why is he doing that? I'm firing him. How's that sound? Yeah, you better laugh, all right? Because the coach is doing exactly what it should do, right? If I keep hitting it to your forehand, you won't be a better player, will you? Because you're already good at that. I'm telling you, life is doing the exact same thing. If you've already got this model of what you're comfortable with and what you're not, and it keeps hitting where you're comfortable, you're stagnant. You don't learn. You don't grow. You don't become a greater being. You don't want that to happen. You do not want that everything you're comfortable with and already done with, and you've become, oh, I'm okay with that, all right? You don't want that to be what's the rest of your life because then you'll never change. You'll never grow. You'll never become greater as a person. Maybe you won't have as many problems you're afraid of, but you won't, I don't know what to say, you won't expand yourself. So a wise person catches on that when events happen outside, and we'll talk about those in a minute, when events happen outside, if I'm conscious, and most people are not, they're lost in this model. So you're all conscious, otherwise you wouldn't know what's going on. I don't mean that. But I mean conscious of being conscious. That's what I mean by conscious. That's what witness consciousness is. Your mindfulness. You're conscious of being conscious. I am aware that I'm in here. How do you know? Because I'm in here. Are you in there? How do you know? Don't even answer me. It's stupid. You know you're in there. You intuitively know you're in there. Well, do you notice that events happen outside? Yep, I do. Because you're conscious. Do you notice that every single event that happens outside of you, when it comes in, causes a change in your thoughts and emotions and the state of your being? Do you notice that? The way the person drives, what a person said to you, whether they said hello, whether they didn't say hello, what the other person is wearing, whether people are talking to a friend of yours at the party but not talking to you. It causes stuff to go on inside, doesn't it? That's your comfort zone, getting hit. That's what's happening. You've built this mental model, a mental emotional model. They go together, the mind and emotions. They're in cahoots. It's a conspiracy. If your mind likes something, your heart opens up. If your mind doesn't like something, your heart gets all scared. Have you ever noticed that if your mind says, I wouldn't like that if that happened. I don't want to grow up and go to a home. I hope my kids don't put me in a home. How do you feel? Scared, anxious. You're 12 years old. Why are you having thoughts like that? You don't even have to have events. All you have to do is have thoughts and the whole inside will change. All right. Do I need to lecture on that? Does anybody notice that your insight changes? I call it inner weather. The weather changes outside. The weather changes inside, doesn't it? Sometimes it's balmy and nice, and sometimes it's a hurricane, and it's rainy and stormy, and it's tough. The point is, everything that comes in is going to hit that mental model and is going to cause it to vibrate, either in a way that's comfortable, because it fit within the model nicely, or in a way that's uncomfortable, because it didn't fit within the model, or in a way that I've never experienced anything, then you really freak out. I, I, can't, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know what it is yet. I'm, I'm so, huh. you've never experienced anything that was close enough the model doesn't know what to do with it. Well, now you're in trouble, aren't you? <laughs> right? So you have to see this, what's happening. Now, the question is, are you conscious? That's what I mean by conscious. Are you conscious that that's happening? Or the minute it starts getting scared, are you scared and you're lost in it? Or are you aware, oh, there it is getting scared. Ever heard the term witness consciousness mindfulness? That's mindfulness. Okay? I said, you're my girlfriend, and I said hello to you, and you were walking with somebody else, a guy. And not only were you working with a guy, I said hello, and you didn't turn around. Oh, that's not comfortable. All right. Are you lost in the jealousy and the fear and the anxiety that came up because it hit your model and didn't fit? You know anything about that? Come on, be honest, (laughs) right? It didn't fit, so it caused that to happen. 
Now, I want to know, are you lost in that, and you're all anxious and scared, and you don't know what to do, and your breath starts going fast, or are you aware that that happened? That's what awareness is. That's what in yoga we mean by a conscious being. Someone who is aware that that event took place outside, and it caused this reaction inside to the psyche, and I'm aware that that happened. That's very different than getting lost in its happening. That's what's meant by a centered conscious being, a being who did not lose their center of consciousness because the psyche went weird on it. That's why you meditate. That's why you do all the different techniques. You don't really do it to go to God. Don't do that. All right? We'll talk about God later. So basically, you become a conscious being. How? I don't care. You do whatever you need to do so that you're still in there being aware. That's how I want it to be. I'm aware it's a nice day, it's sunny, and all of a sudden the boyfriend and this girl or whatever the girlfriend and this boy is walking over there and I say hello and they don't say anything, and oh my God, the whole inside, a hurricane's going on, okay? Are you aware that you were aware that it was nice and are you now aware that you saw that situation that caused all this reaction inside, right? And now they've walked away and you're left with this reaction inside. Are you aware that that's what happened? Or did you get sucked into it and get lost in the reaction that took place, and you're trying to figure out what to do about it, and oh my God, how could you do this to me? You know, it turns out it was your brother, right? You're going to find out 90% of the time it isn't any way your mind took it. Your mind doesn't know. It didn't know whether she heard you. It didn't know who the guy was, but it made up a story real quick, didn't it? Right? Because it wasn't comfortable with that. So all of a sudden, it may believe it knew, didn't it? It was behaving as though it knew what was going on. And it just does it. I'm telling you, it's doing it based on this reaction of your past experiences based on your model. That's all, okay? It, what's really funny is if you had had a previous relationship and you had done that before and it turned out it was your brother, I guarantee you, if it happened in this relationship, right, your mind would say, oh, it's probably just your brother. This is what I want to talk about because you're experienced in that area. Let's just go right there. You can either resist the experience you're having because it didn't fit, or you can learn from the experience you're having and now more things will fit. Which do you want to devote your life to? I'm not talking about something minor here. This is either you're going to devote your life to having frozen this self-concept of what you think should be happening and what you like and what you don't and how it should be. And then when events unfold that fit it, okay, we'll, we'll live with that. And when events unfold that don't fit it, you fight with them. You push them away. You make people say they're sorry. You move. I can't live here anymore. It's ridiculous. All right? And you keep doing things to try to keep it at a distance. And that's when you suppress it. Or, let's just get there right away. Because you're fast learners, I can tell. You sit there and say, good. What good? Good that he hit to my backhand. Because by hitting to my backhand, even though I look stupid because I can't hit it back now, I will soon be able to hit it back. Right? It's impossible that if he keeps hitting it to my backhand and I keep trying, it's impossible I don't get better. That doesn't mean I will be a pro, but I will get better because experience is the teacher, isn't it? All right, and that's true with everything. So why is it not true with life? Why is it that we don't take a seat of consciousness inside and say, I'm in here, I'm on a planet spinning around infinite space, and I ain't staying How about you? And I won't need a rocket ship to get off. (laughs) All right? Somehow I got here, I didn't use a rocket ship, and somehow I'm leaving, and I ain't going to use a rocket ship. But the point is, I'm conscious, I'm here, and I'm going to have these experiences. It is inevitable. I'm not even blaming you, and don't blame yourself. It is inevitable that the experiences you have will leave impressions, positive and negative. They were either nice experiences or not nice experiences. But at least you know about them. Have you ever broken a bone? Yeah, I broke my arm when I was little. Well, you are more experienced than somebody who never broke a bone. They're more scared of it than you are. Do you understand that? You already went through it. Have you seen a rattlesnake? Have you ever seen a rattlesnake coiled up? rattling 10 feet in front of you, all right? When I go hiking, I want the person who has seen it with me, not the person who never has. How about you? Experience is a great thing. Experience makes you a greater being. By definition, every experience you have 
changes your comfort zone if you're willing to have the experience. If you don't have the experience, you're not willing to have the experience, then you sort of cement your comfort zone and go to war with the experience. I have the right to not have had that experience. I don't want to have gotten mugged when I went to New York. Okay, very good. You know, you did, of course, but we don't want to talk about that, right? But the net result is, I don't want to of. So therefore, you've frozen your self-concept, which is just a mental space inside of you, and it's small. How do you know it's small? Because it couldn't handle getting mugged. It wasn't big enough to handle... Come on, who's willing to have this talk? You are better off having every experience you ever had than if you didn't have it. It makes you a greater being. You become more competent. Why? Because experience is the best teacher. So you had this experience. So being mugged when you're in New York, when you went up there, right? It didn't fit within your model of what was going to happen. You're not a person who gets mugged. You know, it was like New York was a fun town, right? And it wasn't so much fun and so on and so forth. And so you push it away. It's called suppression. I'll go right to Freud. It's suppression, repression, call it whatever you want. You have now taken an experience that was real. It came into you, but it didn't fit in you, did it? It didn't fit within your model. So what you did to protect your model It's not protecting you. The thing already happened. It's done. You're not protecting yourself from being mugged by pushing away the experience. The experience is over. Protecting yourself, yes. If if it's happening and you protect yourself, fine. It's perfectly normal. But when the experience is over, then it's over. So if you push away the experience, then you don't integrate it into your being. It just doesn't fit in. That's all I can tell you. What happens when you push it away? I should be a multiple choice test. A, it dissipates into the ethers and goes away because it never happened because I pushed it away. Okay. B, it stays there forever and keeps trying to come back because it has its own energy and I denied that energy and I pushed it away from me. And it's like, what do I do if I want to not have the Colorado River flowing past my house for a little while? Well, I build a Hoover Dam. And, and then what? Then you keep managing and maintaining the Hoover Dam for the rest of your life. Otherwise, you're going to flood. Why? Because the water did not stop flowing. It backed up behind your dam. The pressure of the natural flow of the water has now been dammed. It's now been held back. I am telling you, when that event takes place, that's what actually happened. It has an energy of reality. And it comes in through your senses and it hits your psyche, doesn't it? It hits your self-concept. It hits your little model in there. If it doesn't fit and you push it away, it is the same thing as damming up the Colorado River. It is an unnatural thing to do. The event actually took place. It is supposed to pass through you. It was, in truth, a gift to you. You had the experience. Or I'm not saying you have to want to have the experience. I'm saying you had the experience. Now you have pushed it away. Therefore, you dammed it up. It will keep coming back. By the way, if that didn't happen, there would be no science of psychology. All that psychology is about is studying what happens to you when you push things away. Because if you don't push them away, they pass right through. And you wouldn't go to a therapist. You go to therapists because there's all these things that happened in your past that you couldn't handle. If you hold it back, it builds this mess. What do they call the mess? The subconscious. Yogananda, a great master, once, it was neat, he said it, bold, turban on when he first came to America in the late 20s. You know what he said? There is no subconscious. Doesn't mean Freud was wrong. This is what master meant. If you don't do that, there's not a subconscious. How's that? In other words, there's just a mind. The part of the mind that you won't look at is the subconscious. If I sit here and say, here's a whole room with people, I ain't looking over there, they're not there. They're the not looked at part. They're still there. They're all in the same room, but I'm not looking at them. That's what your subconscious is. The part of your mind where you push the stuff that you don't want to look at. It's the same mind. So someone who's not doing that, like a great master, that isn't doing that, doesn't have any of that stuff in there. They don't have a subconscious. The whole waste that you're doing with your subconscious is part of your mind. You can do math with it. It's like taking your computer you know, now you got quad processors and stuff, right? And filling three of them up with a bunch of garbage in the background. Boy, your machine's slow. Well, of course it's slow. 
three quarters of it's being used on garbage that's not doing anything productive. That's your mind. The more you shove away, the more you say no, that experience can't have happened. <laughs> that's really brilliant. Which one? The one that did. <laughs> Okay, you don't push away the one that didn't. And so you push this thing away and it starts occupying a part of your mind that you don't want to look at because you keep pushing it away. So you're in so much trouble. That's why I don't like standardized testing. Do you know that you think you took an IQ test and it tells you how smart you are? No, it did not. It told you now that you're handicapped with all the junk you shoved down there that's holding all of your mental power and all of your energy. Mommy's divorced and daddy didn't take you to the ball game and your first boyfriend broke up with you and this happened and Sally went out with Fred and, and that's what's going on. And now, now go take an IQ test. Should I take the IQ test when a nice thing happened to me yesterday or should I take the IQ test when a traumatic thing happened to me yesterday? Which one do you want to tell me that the results won't be different? There's no chance, is it? You do math real well after your boyfriend broke up with you? Well, I don't think so, because the mind is preoccupied with stuff. That's what happens when you push this stuff away. It gets stuck in a part of you. That's stuck. You're holding it there, right? Just like the Hoover Dam. You're holding it there, and you have to expend what we call chi, shakti, energy. You have to expend willpower to keep pushing it away. How about if I ask you that? If you stopped pushing it away, what would happen? It will come back up. Which one of you don't think that stuff that you didn't want to pay attention to that you pushed away down there, that if you just one day, something reminded you of it, doesn't, doesn't come back up anyways, right? Little, you hear a word, you see a smell, the whole feeling comes back up, right? The whole thing, because you kept it. It's not natural. It's not meant to be down there. You know how it's meant to be? When something is over outside, it is over inside. Ooh, Ooh, yeah, that's, that's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> right? But how natural is that? If it's over outside and it's not over inside, then you're missing the next moment. Because you kept it inside, so you can't experience what's happening next. And you know that happens, don't you? You get all for stunken for who knows how long, because something happened that you don't like. All right? And then you miss the rest. So the alternative to this, to go very quickly, is to say... If an experience happens outside, I'm not saying you have to want it. I'm not saying we can't work with what's going to happen next. We can talk about that. But if it actually happened in the past or is happening right now, you can't do anything about that. So to keep the past inside of you pushed away so that it doesn't bother you is to make sure it's always bothering you. That's what that stuff does. You got mugged. It was an experience. You're, you, you survived the foreign wars of mugging, all right? And you're a person that can tell interesting stories. And if all of a sudden a mugging started to take place again, you'd be better off knowing what to do. You wouldn't freeze up as much. You've been through it before. You know it's not as freaky as somebody else thinks it is. Do you know, I used to live up north. When I came down from up north when I was 13 or whatever, we went down to Miami, I was afraid to go into the ocean. Why? There are sharks. Now, most of you kids grew up in Miami or in Florida. Many of you did. And you wouldn't ever think like that. Yes, there are sharks, but it doesn't mean you can't go in the ocean. I mean, there aren't that many sharks. People swim in the ocean all the time, don't they? All right? But if you haven't ever experienced it, you have a whole different attitude. It's true of everything. I told the story once, go the other way, where there was this girl who told me she can't go to New York. I said, Why? She said, because I, don't, I can't drive up there. I said, well, there are cabs. Oh, no, 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 you can't take a cab. Oh, no, no, a woman cannot take a cab alone in New York. What, are you crazy? Oh, my God, absolutely. Now, you go talk to a New York woman and see if they take cabs. It's based on your experience. So I'm trying to show you. So because you had the experience of swimming in the ocean, you know how to handle yourself. It doesn't mean there are not sharks, right? It doesn't mean you don't be cautious, you know, aware. And the same thing with rattlesnakes out here. I shouldn't tell you guys that because you stop coming out. There are snakes out here in the woods. We see them all the time. We see coral snakes. Lately, I haven't seen them. You see a lot of rattlesnakes. We got a pond, a swamp over there, water moccasins. No one has ever, ever, I've been here 45 years. A lot of people come out. No one has ever been bothered by a snake out here. Wow. Therefore, my experience of snakes is different than people who never saw one. If I sat there and said, oh, there's a coral snake. Coral snakes have to be some of the most poisonous snakes in North America, all right? Very poisonous snake. But it has to chew on you, and it doesn't strike. 
you'd have to literally try to get it to bite you, all right? It's not a natural thing that happens. It runs away. You don't need to be afraid of coral snakes. You need to watch where you're walking, you know, especially if it's very hot out. See, I'm showing you I'm an experienced being with living in the woods and having snakes. Maybe you're not. Maybe the very thought that there's a snake somewhere out there scares the hell out of you. Who's better off, me or you? Especially if we're walking in the woods. You'll all freak out. Maybe you'll step on the coral snake because you're freaking out versus someone who's just a coral snake and you walk on. That's how we all are out here. So I'm just showing you experience is priceless. Experience is a gift. Experience makes it so your comfort zone expands. Do you see that? Unless you resist the experience. And if you resist the experience, your comfort zone becomes more intact, right? Because you're committed to it. No, I'm not going to live in Florida. There are snakes. I'm not going to live in the woods. There are snakes. And I'm not living by the ocean. There are sharks. Where are you going to live? What are you going to do? Man, every time you do that, your little world gets smaller and smaller and smaller, doesn't it? And the next thing you know, you can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. Don't talk to strangers. Don't ride in cabs in New York. You want to be like that? You want to live like that? I don't want you to live like that, right? Versus you start having experience. I'm not telling you you have to go out and do crazy things, but at a minimum, at least have the experiences you've had. You've already been through them. I beg you with that. All these experiences that already happened to you, they're over. They already happened. You made it. Congratulations. You lived. They're done. Why are you holding those things at a distance from you? Because they don't fit inside your model even now. I don't want my parents to have gotten divorced. I don't want my first boyfriend to have left me. I didn't want my teacher to get sick. I liked her so much in in fifth grade. Oh my God, I never liked math ever since. Well, there's something wrong with you. And so you get to the point where you start saying, if I have a choice, events are going to unfold and I can either become a greater being because of the experiences I had or I can become so screwed up that I'll never enjoy my life by resisting the experiences that happened to me and just be all suppressed. Thereby, my model becomes tiny. I'm committed to it, very conservative. I'm just committed to that model. And then I push everything else away and I have to fight to keep it all away. That person has major problems. Wherever they go, it doesn't fit. And then events happen that remind them of the old stuff. And that's how people get closed. That's called being closed. How's that for a different to closed? I closed my mind to anything. This is what I believe in. This is what I want to happen. This is what's right. You hear it? No one like that, all right? This is what it is. And all those other things, I don't want to talk about them. You know, in this house, we don't talk about that anymore. No, you don't want to be like that. There's no life like that. And you think you're going to find somebody, your special person, and bring them into that closed world of yours so that you can feel some love? You will never feel love like that. That's not how it works. So you start realizing that life is a gift. It is a gift because every moment in front of you, there is something happening, isn't it? Okay? And some of it's old, and some of it's new, and some of it's likable, and some of it's not likable. Guess what? Good. A wise person says thank you to every single experience that they are honored to have while they're alive. And if you will do that, the experiences will come in, and even if they're not comfortable, you will have had the experience. So a snake shows up, rattles around. Oh, my God, that's scary. You don't need to see nothing when a rattlesnake crawls or when a rattle's going. That is not a nice place to be. You'd rather be anywhere else, all right? But you had the experience, and now you move on, and you'd be grateful for having the experience. You're not mad at the snake for being a snake. You just had this experience. And all of a sudden you realize you're more comfortable next time because you know that nothing happened. Or what if something did happen? You learn. I learned. I was stupid to run. I was stupid to throw something at him. Be a student that appreciates every single lesson that's being taught to you so you can become a being that's able to incorporate and encompass and experience the rest of life that's going to come to you. You should be a wholer person every single day. There's no such thing as a traumatic experience. There's just an experience that you couldn't handle. You refused to handle it, so you pushed it away. Now anything about it is traumatic to you. If you go to have a raw shock test, you'll beat the guy up. Because he's talking about your traumatic experience. They're they're ink blots. But they don't look like ink blots, do they? They look like getting mugged. (laughs) They're all like rattlesnakes. A bunch of rattlesnakes. That's why they give you those ink blots. 
because that stuff's still in there. You don't want that stuff in there. So it's sort of like one, you can push it away, then it will make you sick and stay there and cause trouble your entire life and limit the world that you can experience. Or you can let it in and let your whole being grow and become a knower of that area. I'm an experiencer of that sort of thing. Now you're greater. And life, you'll find eventually that life is actually your friend. It keeps giving you experiences. It keeps giving you experiences. If you're married, it's wonderful. You got married. It was neat. You get to experience being married. If something goes wrong, God forbid, whatever, it goes wrong and you end up getting divorced, you're a wholer person. You knew what it was like to fall in love. You knew what it was like to have a beautiful relationship. You watched it fall apart. Maybe the stuff you did, he did, she did. Who the heck knows, right? You are now more experienced to watch this thing have gone south. Maybe you can look back and say, you know, if I hadn't started complaining, like I just started complaining a lot, right? Or if I could handle the fact that he was having some bad days, maybe this thing could have lasted. Good. Don't get mad at yourself that it didn't. Be grateful that you are now a learner of how relationships can get screwed up. Don't go out there and say, I'll never have another one. I'll never marry again. What's the matter with you? Now, instead of learning, you let it scar you. Instead, you'd be somebody who said, man, I am more ready now to have a more deep and meaningful and lasting relationship than I was before. I was too young and it just, I was too lost in my ways. I thought it was all supposed to be the way I wanted. Now I understand it's not like that. You know, you have to give some, whatever it is. The point is you learn, don't you? Are you willing to learn? A wise person sits there and says, literally, it's very high, just literally, bring it on. What? Bring it on. Bring what on? Life. Life. Well, don't you want to decide what you're supposed to learn? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to take you into your first year of algebra. You just graduated your little whatever you do before algebra. You don't know any algebra. You never heard of a sine or a cosine or a tangent or any of those. I still know those things. Wow. All right, some weird thing like that, right? And I want you to go into that class and start telling the teacher what you want to learn. You wouldn't even think of doing that, would you? Because you don't know anything. That's what you're doing with life. You're saying, these are the experiences I've already had that I know I'm comfortable with. That's what I want to learn. I want to have more of those. You're crazy. You should say to life, I'm yours. I'm here on the planet for a short period of time. You're only here for a few years. And during that time, now you listen carefully, there are so many things going on, but I only get to experience the one that's in front of me. How about you? You only experience the one in front of you. Is that the only one that's going on? (laughs) I doubt it. It's going on everywhere, isn't it? So I'm going to miss, that's how I look at it. I'm going to miss 99.9999999% of everything that's going on everywhere. It's in the whole universe, by the way. Mars, everywhere there's something going on in there. How small is that part that you see compared to what's going on? Wow. But let me at least not miss that. No, let me miss the part I get to see. I'm missing everything else. I don't want to miss that too. So a wise person says to life, bring it on. I don't know what I need to learn. I only know that if I'm honored enough to have a moment unfold in front of me, I am letting that teach me everything I can, as much as I can to learn about that moment so it becomes part of my being. That which you actually learn becomes part of your being. You you know it by heart. If you were young and you touched the stove, does that mean you never buy a stove? Does that mean you never cook again? No, that's what happens if you resist the experience. If you have the experience, you don't have to think about it. You don't touch stoves, right? That's how everything should be to you. Everything. So let's say you need to give a talk at a class. Has anybody noticed that maybe you get a little nervous before you have to go? Anybody? Yes? Okay. So that's just the thing you learned. I'm a veteran of the talks, okay? And you're going to give this talk and you notice, that, you know, she does this and she does this and does the thing. And then you go up and you give the talk. You've given talks before. Every one of you have. You've, since you were young, you sat there and you gave a talk and either it didn't go so good and you said, oh, I should have done this if I had studied more. You learned something or it went fine and everybody clapped and you did good and the teacher said, oh yeah, was, you did really well with that. And you sat down. Did you look back at the part of you that was all scared and told you you were going to do terrible and tell it, you see, it bothered me all day for no reason I did fine. No, you didn't. You just let it be that way. But the point is, next time when you go to give a talk, 
you're more capable of not getting as scared. You're more capable of feeling more comfortable. And then by the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time, you join the debate team. You actually learn. You are better off because you went through this than if you didn't. Then why are we resisting it? Why are we sitting there saying life has to be the way we want? Because if life was the way you want, you would have never given the first talk. I don't want to do it. Let him do it. And now you're terrible, you know, in that area. So a wise person sits here and says, I'm in here. I need to grow spiritually. That's why I'm telling you where psychology and spirituality go. Psychology is about when you resist. Spirituality is about when you don't. It's that close. Right. Well, what happens when I don't? What you're going to find out eventually, and this I know you don't know, is there is a part of your being, you, that is way greater than anything you have any idea of. And I mean way greater. There's a part of your being that knows a lot more than anything you ever learned. It's that intuitive, creative part of your being. All right? It just knows. How does it know? It just knows. Literally. It can feel things. It knows things. How does an animal know not to eat the poisonous plants? I don't know which ones are poisonous. How about you? <laughs> all right? How can, a, how can a raccoon know? Well, they don't eat them. And they'd all be dead. And I don't mean the plants. How do they know that? There is a part of your being that is not your mind, that is your being, that is in harmony with nature, that is in harmony with other people, that when you get the mind out of the way, actually experiences things, feels things. You touch that in the intimate moments where you're so open that your mind's not thinking. You just merge into the love and beauty of another person or your the pet or music. Right? They're all intimate moments where you lose yourself and you're just doing it in, oh, by heart. That's all I can say. He said, I played by heart. What does that mean? I wasn't reading the notes. I wasn't thinking, what do I do next? It's a C, it's an E, it's a J. Oh, that's where that... It's not the mind. It's your, in sports, they go into that. They call it getting into the zone. Go talk to a golfer or a baseball player where you don't go up there to the plate. I wonder if it's going to hit a hard ball, a fastball. Will I get a curve? I hope I get a curve. If you're doing that, you're striking out. You don't stand a chance that literally they go into a zone where they're so present that there's full consciousness on what the pitcher is doing and they're right there. It, the, the mind is not fast enough, but your being is. So what you'll find eventually is that there is a part of your being which is your being, you, you in there, the self, the Atman, the soul, call it whatever you want. Your being is very, very wise, not knowledgeable, wise, do you know that in India, the great masters like Ramakrishna, he didn't even go to school. Surgeons used to come to him before major surgeries to get his advice. Prime ministers would come all the time. All the great leaders of India go to their gurus, right? Not for some spiritual mumbo jumbo, but literally because the wisdom that comes out of their mouths because of how in tune they are with reality is wiser than what these people learn in their books. So you're that way too. That's all I can tell you. Well, why don't I experience that? Because you're scared. Because you're so addicted to what the mind is saying, to the limitations of what you think you're capable of doing and not capable of doing, what you're afraid of and what you like and what you don't, that the whole of your consciousness is completely absorbed in your comfort zone and then trying to make the world that way. Therefore, as you have more experiences, it literally is the evolution of your soul. That's like sometimes people say to me, there's a whole thing about what does it mean that the soul evolves? What the heck does that mean spiritually? Especially some people, very high beings, say, I thought the soul was perfect. I thought that it was all-knowing and perfect. I, I don't understand. What does it mean it evolves? This is where you can understand both of those. There is the perfection of your being. Those who want to understand the spiritual aspect. There's the perfection of your being. You in there are very high being. But what you're looking at is not so high. <laughs> you're studying this limited model of mind that is limited to what you've already experienced and are comfortable with. As you have more experiences, that expands. So literally, it's liberating your soul. As you have more experiences and there are more things in life that you're comfortable with, there are less things in life you have to be afraid of. That's how you truly learn to not be afraid. Like a fearless person is not someone who's strong and can keep the fear away. It's someone that is open enough to let experiences come in and if there's some trepidation, they're comfortable with that so that they can go through this learning process. 
Like if you go in and start taking calculus and it's hard, do you drop it? What are you sitting there and say, been here, done that. <laughs> I've been in other classes that were hard and I stayed with them and I made it. That's because you've experienced. The more experiences like that you have, the freer you become. So I don't have to speak about liberation in terms of samadhi or some high spiritual state. I don't like that liberation. I like real liberation. You become liberated by having experiences, don't you? You become liberated by letting life fit within you so that you don't have to limit the scope of life to the limits of your being. And all of a sudden it becomes wider and wider until someday you realize and a very great day comes see me when it happens that you don't have anything to be afraid of. Why? Because you've already experienced everything? No. Because you already know how to experience things. And big deal, it's just another thing. You hear me? That nothing will ever bother you again for the rest of your life. How would you like to know that? How would you like to reach a state where you know to the core of your being that nothing will ever bother you again for the rest of your life? You have nothing to be afraid of. You have nothing to be anxious about. You don't have to be scared of what people think about you. You've been through a thing where a friend turned on you, right? Is it terrible if a friend turns on you? No, it's a very important experience. Sometimes they do that. Sometimes people have reasons and they get weird and they do different things. Who the heck knows? All kinds of things can happen to you, right? Good. If you're comfortable with it and you've been through it, all right, not, not that you hated the friend. How about, you know, when you're great, a friend turns on you because they were going through something, you handle it. Okay, yep, yeah, that happens. It hurt. Comfortable with it. Then they come back. They don't even owe an explanation. Who wants to be a great being? They f- that all of it fit inside of you, so there's nothing that needs to be said. You know what that's called? Compassion. I'm showing you where psychology stops and spirituality starts. All right, psychology starts and ends because you're resisting your experiences. Spirituality starts and ultimately ends. Because you are not resisting your experiences. You're imbibing them. They are like the rivers pouring into the ocean. They're feeding you. They become part of you until eventually you're so expansive. You're so open that all of life fits inside of you. You're a centered, clear being. And that's where you know, people say, I want to know God. I said, we come to God at the end. Look at that. Perfect. You do not want to know God. You do not want to know God. Why? Because God is everything. And there's no way you're letting everything inside of you. Is there? <laughs> right? This is the God you want to know. I'm limited. I need someone to pray to to make sure it happens exactly the way I want. And I call it God of the mind. There it is. No, don't let this happen. No, I don't want to have the experience of my child dying. No, I don't want this to happen. No, I don't want my husband to leave. No, I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to break a bone. No, I don't want to. No, no, please, God, please. And the poor God sitting there saying, but I thought you wanted to know me. I'm everything. I am the broken bone. I am the, the marriage. I am the divorce. I am the child. I am birth. I am death. I am everything. If I'm the creator of the universe, then I'm absolutely everything. Then how is it that you're telling me you want to know me when you don't? You want to know you. You want me to know you. You don't want to know me. You're just trying to make it all fit inside of you. Well, the universe doesn't fit inside of you. You've only had these tiny little experiences. Haven't you? I already said you missed everything else, didn't you? The universe is everything you missed. You're everything you didn't miss. Which one's bigger? By the way, that's not a bad way to think about God. You want God to be that which you experience, the good ones happening again, the bad ones never happening, right? God is every single thing and the moons and the stars and every single thing that you missed, every single second. Big. Big, that's big, isn't it? All right, good eternal, infinite, right? So if you want to know anything about that force, and you can know everything about that force, you can know more about that than you know about yourself. But you have to be willing to not know about yourself. You have to be willing to not devote yourself to this limited model that you built based on your experiences, right? Christ said you must die to be reborn. Ever heard that one? You must die to be reborn. What does that mean? Exactly what I just said. You have to be willing to die of the personal self in order to experience the expansiveness of your spiritual self. Otherwise, you will limit yourself to this tiny little thing. Got it? I hope you got it. So I started very simple. Experience is a great teacher. 
Way greater than you thought, isn't it? Experience is literally a spiritual state of being. It's a spiritual experience. What's a spiritual experience? That's why I don't like people say, oh, I had a spiritual experience. You have one every single second of your life. Life is a spiritual experience. If you handle it properly, otherwise it's scary as hell, <laughs> right? Which is life. A beautiful gift from God, a beautiful spiritual experience every second, or the most scary thing in the whole. Well, it depends. If you want to let it in, it expands you. You become a great being. If you limit yourself to your junk, you know what I mean, right? To your limitations, then life is scary because it doesn't fit in there. So this is the most important thing you decide. Am I going to commit myself to the limits of my comfort zone, to my self-concept, and try to push everything else away and fight with life to keep it away from me? Or am I going to become a rare, bold being that says, I'm missing every other experience. Hell if I'm missing the one I'm having. And then more, just as important, at least the one you're having, I understand you're a little scared of it. It's happening. You haven't seen it before. But the ones that already happened, why are you scared of those? They're already done. I just don't understand. Really. Why would you be scared of that which already happened and you made it through? Why in the world would you keep that inside of you? All the things that you didn't like instead of letting them integrate and celebrate the experiences you got to go through. All right. So that's my lecture on experience. Experience is a pretty great thing, isn't it? Don't miss it. Don't resist it. Now, in order to do that, I spend a moment with witness consciousness. Your personal being is going to react because it's limited to what it's capable of vibrating at based on its past experiences. That doesn't mean you have to side with it. When you become conscious, what do I do if something happens and he starts getting weird? Doesn't mean he doesn't do that, right? Of course. He's got a human in there. But you, you got a human in there, but you don't get to say, I'm only human. Those are two very different statements. You are not only human. You get to watch a human, but you who's watching is not human. You see her get weird? Can she get weird? Her heart start to get weird and flutter and like that? Yes or no? How do you know? How do you know that's happening? Because I see it. Who does? Me. Well, you who sees it aren't it. You're the one who sees it. Be that being. That's your whole spiritual journey. So what do you do when something happens and starts getting weird and they relax? Relax. Relax. By relaxing, you're not resisting. And if you don't resist, it will come in and it will pass through. And you will be a greater being for it. You mean it won't hurt? It might hurt. So what? You play sports, you can get hurt. You still play. You get in relationships, you can get hurt. You still, I hope you still get in relationships, <laughs> right? There's a quote from Gibran in On Love, the prophet, beautiful book, where he says, those of you who would know love's joy, but not love's pain, then step out of her threshing floor into the seasonless world where you will laugh, but not all your laughter, and you will cry, but not all your tears. In other words, come on, open up. Open up. Even love has stuff to teach you that's not always so much fun, is it? Does that mean you close down? There's nothing wrong with something hurting. There's nothing wrong with exercising till you feel pain. No pain, no gain. There's nothing wrong with pushing yourself past in anything. And it's, that goes for life too. Life will come in, and if it doesn't fit, it could cause some disturbance. Just relax and welcome it relax, eventually you'll get good at it. And you'll see that every single bit that comes in makes you a greater being. And the next time it happens, it doesn't bother you as much. And then the next time it happens, you don't even know why it bothered you to start with. That's spiritual growth, isn't it? It's not an experience you have. It's a state of your being has expanded. And now you can embrace all of life and wake up every morning and can't wait to see what's going to happen next with no fears or trepidations. Work on these things. Mm, Jackrative.